Hello class. Now we will talk about water balance and electrolyte balance. So this is very related to our, our last section on the urinary system because your kidneys are the ones really that can uh, um, influence your water balance, electrolyte balance, right? So let's get right to it. All right, cool. <clears throat> Got a kidney right in that first uh, slide. All right. So this balance, you have to realize that you have within you a certain amount of water and a certain percentage of all these electrolytes, meaning sodium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, phosphate, sulfates, all these electrolytes um, and water has to be in balance for all the functioning. Remember your muscles have to function after the right amount of um, uh, calcium, right? That's released that makes the, you know, everything happen. Remember your nerves need uh, phosphate, uh, uh, sodium and, and, and uh, potassium levels in order to, for that to work. So these things have all got to be right. You have to have the right percentages of all of these or your cells, something bad happens if they get out of whack. And you may drink a little bit of water or gallons of water. And um, at the end of the day, you have to get rid of that excess water perfectly well. If you retain a little bit of water each day, you're gonna blow up eventually like a balloon, right? Or if you lose a little bit too much water, you're gonna shrink. And again, you'll lose 12% and die, or you're gonna turn into a raisin. So um, it's just amazing how this happens. And our, our, so in this lecture, we'll talk about the water, you know, and how we keep it in balance. We have the same amount of water in our bodies, no matter what we drink or eat. And now all these electrolytes, how we keep that in balance too. There's this equilibrium where, you know, if we have too much calcium, we get rid of it. You know, too little, we, we make, need more of it. And so each one of these is a balancing act. And um, hormones, remember calcitonin, parathyroid hormone, uh, uh, and uh, ADH and aldosterone hormones influence water and, uh, and sodium. Uh, so all these, these checks and balances are negative feedback to keep all the electrolytes in the water properly balanced. And your kidneys are right at the center of this, right? Your kidneys have this ability to conserve or get rid of excess ions in water. All right, so when we talk about water and electrolytes, and electrolytes are substances that, that ionize in, in, in water, you know? So sodium chloride turns into sodium and chloride ions, right? Charged substances. And the two of them, of course, are related because when you look at their concentrations, I mean, electrolytes are, are dissolved in water. So you get rid of more water, your electrolytes go up in concentration, right? Um, you drink uh, too much water. Yeah, I'll talk about that. Like if you drink too much water, it's called hyponatremia, then you don't have enough, high enough levels of sodium because you've diluted it and you need that. So important. So again, water electrolytes, because they're dissolved in each other, they're, they're related to each other. All right, let's talk body fluids. So you know you're mostly water, right? We are water creatures. We evolved from salt water. We, are, we start out life in, in mom's amni amniotic fluid, and then we live our life on land. But again, we're always in danger of, uh, if we don't drink enough, that death is shortly uh, ahead of us. So the water in our bodies, let's talk about where the water is in our bodies and the electrolytes. Uh, yeah. And again, this looks a little, a lot of chemistry down here, but these are extracellular fluids and intracellular fluids. So these are the fluids that are in your cells. And you can see that there's differences. And this is the fluid that surrounds the cells, right? Uh, so in our bodies, how much is in the cells and how much is around the cells? Well, we know that about two thirds of your, of your water is inside the cells. I guess that makes sense. We have trillions of cells. <clears throat> They're all little sacks of water. So yeah, and extracellular is the remaining 37%. I'd buy that. There's um, male and female differences. It turns out that muscle holds a lot more uh, water than fat. You think about fat, oil and water don't mix. So. With obesity, you have a much less percentage of water. It can be down to 45%. Um, 
But um, in general, uh, you can see here, men 63% water, men 52. This is a big average. I mean, women in this class have more muscle mass and, and uh, less body fat than some of the men in the class. So there's, you know, there's gonna be, um, uh, obviously this is just an average, but on average men have greater muscle mass, therefore they, they're made up of more water overall. And as you get age, it's amazing. You can see a fetus, 90% water. You guys, 60, 65% water. And as you get older, look at the old person, they kind of, kind of turn into a raisin. You lose, you lose, you get more uh, dried out <clears throat> as you get older. So you can see percentage of water really, you know, changing as we uh, go through our life stages. This kind of shows you, you have um, most of the water is inside all those cells that are filled up with water. And then uh, this water here is the water that's kind of around the cells, the interstitial fluid. Um, oh, obviously in blood, remember plasma is 90 some percent water. So we have there, yeah. Lymph, oh yeah, that lymph fluid, that's also carried uh, by lymph vessels from around the cells. And then this is called the transcellular fluid. And that just means it's fluid that's in some kind of um, epithelial line sac. I'll give you some examples your cerebral spinal fluid. Remember that? You make it in your brain, the ventricles of your brain, that choroid plexus, and it circulates over and down your spinal cord. That's, a, that's mostly water. Oh, and your eyeballs, the, the aqueous and vitreous humor of your eyeballs. In your joints, the fluid in your joints and the pleural cavity. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's called transcellular fluid because it's within some kind of sac, membrane-bound sac, yeah. All right, but again, in your cells, most of it, 63, extracellular fluid, the rest of it. All right, the chemistry, uh, chemistry wise, here it all is down below, it's true. What do I want you to take away from this? You don't want you to memorize all these things? I mean, what I want you to know is, that I think you already know, which because we talked about the nervous system, we talked about inside the cell, lots of potassium, outside the cell, lots of sodium, and that's what causes the, um, uh, or they switch, right? The depolarization of neurons and things. So just re keep remembering that. So um, sodium is found on the outside and potassium is found inside the cell. We have a sodium potassium pump, right? That exchanges those two. So sodium gets kicked out, three of those, two potassiums get kicked in. So these pumps are moving constantly to keep this huge difference as you can see there. And chloride goes with the sodium, uh, so you see a lot of salt on the outside, potassium on the inside. All right, so this fluid that's in these different places, in the cells, in the interstitial fluid, plasma or blood, what about the movement between them? What's going to cause water and electrolytes to move between them? Well, there's only really two factors. Uh, one is hydrostatic pressure. That could be blood pressure and capillaries or some kind of uh, pressure and then osmotic pressure because water is always going to go to the saltier or more concentrated solution. So how is this working on your tissues here? Well, you can see in your blood capillaries that hydrostatic pressure pushes out the fluid early on in the capillary. And then that fluid gets sucked back in by osmosis at the other end when there's less pressure, there's more osmosis, right? And that, you know, that pressure, that slight amount of pressure out there is gonna move fluid into the lymphatic vessels. Once it's in there, it's trapped, it'll move back to the blood eventually. And normally the cells and extracellular fluid, they're, they're kind of equal, equal uh, in osmosis and pressure. So there's not a lot of movement back and forth. But you know, if you get um, super dehydrated, it'll suck the water out of the cells or, you drink too much water, water will be forced into the cells, the cells will expand. Yes, so this balance, and again, it, it always blows me away to think about no matter how much you drink or how little you drink, you pee out just enough, you know, so your body has this beautiful control. And it's in your brain, your hypothalamus, where you have cells that um, are the, the uh, are recognizing how watery or how salty the fluid is. And if you're super dehydrated, those things shrink up and they'll send out EDH. 
And if they're blown up because you've drunken too much, you drink too much, um, they're going to inhibit ADH and uh, hopefully you pee out and get rid of some of that water. So we're going to talk about what are the inputs and outputs of water. So you guys think about it. What do you think is the greatest um, input of water? Oh, drinking. All right. yeah, drinking. All right. What about output? It is peeing. It's urinating. Urinating. Yeah. What are some other outputs of water besides peeing? Oh, breathing out. You breathe in a mirror. You see that condensation. Sweating. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So we're going to get to that right now. All right, first water intake. Uh, most of it, and you know, as average person, let's say they have about 2,500 milliliters of water. <clears throat> and the drinking doesn't have to be water. It can be coffee and whiskey or whatever you're drinking has water in it. So that's the water you're taking in through your mouth. Now 30% is from you know, moist foods. You eat a lettuce, it's mostly water, right? And so on that. And then this other one, this, this, this smallest amount is called this uh, water metabolism. Or um, when you look at the uh, um, chemical reactions, water is given off over here. And uh, for us, it's just a minor part of it. But for a desert rat, it may be like 90%. They might never drink. But um, when they break down carbs, catabolism of, of carbs, they, they end up water as a byproduct. And so that's what they, they get their water. Us, we need to drink water. We can't we don't get that much that way. So there you go. Is drinking, most of our water comes in, uh, wet food, and then uh, a little bit just from uh, chemical reactions gives us, gives us water. Uh, now getting to outputs, we'll get to this, but you can see it's mostly peeing. All right, so when do you get thirsty? When you lose half your water? No. You guys, I already taught you, when you lose 12% of your water, you're gonna die. I mean, okay, so clearly what percent? It turns out 1%, yeah. Like 1% will drop, you begin, you begin thirsty. You're like, ooh, I need some, I need to drink something. And then how it happens, of course, is that those, those cells in your hypothalamus start shrinking because osmosis sucks the water out of them because your body fluids are more concentrated. Yeah, and then um, you will, um, um, feel the urge to be thirsty, and then um, um, ADH will help your kidneys retain water. Everything you can do to keep you from dropping any further in, in water concentration. And this is fascinating. Are you ready? When you, let's say you're thirsty and you drink some water, now your body, just when it hits your stomach and kind of distends your stomach, that is the feedback to say, dude, we got some water. Now, your body could wait until it's more hydrated because once it hits the stomach, it hasn't been absorbed yet into your bloodstream. But your body realizes if you drink something, it's gonna be absorbed. Now, the reason it does this is that if you waited until that water was absorbed in the bloodstream, made your way to your brain, you would overdrink because you would drink and nothing would happen. You keep drinking and it would take a while for that to be absorbed, right? So it's just the act of drinking and it hitting your stomach that, uh, inhibits you from that being thirsty again. And your body is just trusting that if you drink some water that it's gonna be absorbed. Cool stuff, yeah. And then once you drink, that water will be absorbed in your intestines and uh, into your bloodstream and it will raise your water level. In your hypothalamus, those cells will return to normal and you will not have the great uh, urge to drink something. Output, how do we get rid of water? Well, that urinating, yeah, yeah. Even if you're dehydrated like crazy, you're lost in a desert, you still need some water to get rid of urine, you know? We just can't get rid of a paste, a solid, you know, nitrogen, right? So uh, urine is where we lose most of it. Feces, and if you have uh, diarrhea, uh, that's a major killer of, of children, especially in, in other countries where they can't hook up to an IV because they don't have that much water in the first place. And if you have some cholera disease where you're just, feces is just like water, it's, you're gonna dehydrate and it'll cause a death, right? Yeah. But normally, you know, it's just moist feces are gonna have you know, some of the water. And then sweat, again, huge depends on your activity levels and, and your uh, environment, your temperature, right? 
And then, yeah, um, you evaporate water from your skin all the time. And then sweating is just going to really ramp that up when you really secrete water to get rid of it, to get rid of heat. Yeah. And then the lungs, of course, you know, and you, you notice this, if you oh, breathe on a window, you see all that condensation. So with every breath you take, oh, oh, you see on a cold day, you see the water vapor coming out. So we can't breathe without losing some water. And so it's a, it's, it's a loss that we can't really control. You know, we, need, we have to get rid of that. So which of those can your body regulate the most? Um, evaporation from the skin? No. Um, you know, sweating? Turns it, you know, I mean, I was going to say, it, one of the great dangers when you have a heat stroke is you stop sweating, you know, because your body's like, okay, I, I have no water to give. And then your body temperature is going to go high. Yeah? But <clears throat> urination, right? So we have the ability to really, we just talked about this, how we can pee out watery pee or concentrated pee. So that's the one we really do. We can't help with our breathing. We can't breathe out less uh, moisture. All right, beautiful. So what happens when you're dehydrated? Exactly, the fluid becomes concentrated and then you're gonna uh, release ADH in the bloodstream from your pituitary. It's gonna make it to those uh, um, 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 collecting ducts, a little bit of the distal tube, and it's going to say, dude, keep the water. Let's not pee. Don't waste water with pee. And so your urine output is going to decrease and prevent you from, you know, losing water as best it can, right? You need water eventually. What if you drink too much water? That's the opposite. Your hypothalamal cells will be swollen, and they're going to say, oh, no more ADH. Don't give the kidneys ADH. So with no ADH, those tubes are impermeable to water, you pee out a bunch of water. And uh, hopefully that'll get the water levels down. Because well, the next lecture I'll talk about too much water, you can die of that, water intoxication. So again, beautiful homeostasis where your, your thirst and the amount of pee you produce is just kept there so that um, whatever your water intake, uh, you can keep it uh, balanced. All right, electrolytes. So you guys, electrolytes, <clears throat> like I say, sodium, chloride, magnesium, potassium, all these things in your body. And so uh, where do they come from? Well, they come from what you're eating or drinking, right? A bunch of potato chips, yeah, lots of sodium, right? Uh, eat that banana, lots of potassium. That's what's coming in. And then you make some from the reactions in your body too, of course. Um, the output, where's it going? Also the urine. So with your pee is going to be hydrogen ions and calcium, whatever you want to get rid of. So it'll be lost in your feces and then sweating. And your sweat here, you're going to get rid of, uh, so it's going to be salty, right? You, you give off water, but salt too. It's one way to get rid of uh, electrolytes. So the ones we care about the most are the ones we've talked about in this class. Like we don't talk about aluminum. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure that's one, but we don't talk about that because it's just it's such a minor, minor one. But big ones are sodium and chloride, salt. Sodium is the most common electrolyte in your body. Potassium, oh my God. I talked about the heart chapter. I talked about the muscle chapter. One of the lethal inject injection drugs is potassium. will stop your heart. So it has to be just right. Calcium, oh my God, right? At the, um, the synapse, you need calcium to come in to, to cause the neurotransmitter to go across. Your muscles, it's calcium that, that, that's kept in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? Magnesium, don't talk much about that, but you need the right amounts of that. Sulfates, phosphates, bicarbonate, talked about that with carbon dioxide. And, and hydrogen ions are going to be your, your pH of your body. And so it's got to be just right. You got to keep your pH in this, this narrow interval that, um, or you die, right? So these are the big ones and, you, and you've heard of them and now, um, um, yeah, they're pretty, pretty obvious there. And as those of you know about muscle cramps, oh, you know, potassium is often a lack of potassium. Again, there's some, probably many causes, we don't know exactly what's going on, but uh, potassium deficiency has been you know, linked to uh, muscle cramps. Now, <clears throat> normally normal diets, don't worry about it. I mean, you don't need any, uh, uh, supplements or anything like that. Normal diet should give you the calcium, magnesium, sodium, enough of it that your body can get rid of any excess in your, in your pee. So fine. But if you have a deficiency, then you could have these, these cravings for salty foods. I get that. Well, I think I'm just hungry, but you, uh, 
you uh, you crave salt because um, it gives you the electrolytes. And so evolutionarily, you know, you crave sugar, it gives you the calories. Uh, you like umami, that kind of uh, um, amino acids because they only has protein. And then uh, you like salty foods because your body craves that. And you can put out salt licks for deer or for cows or moose. They love to lick salt uh, because um, they get those electrolytes. So your body knows you need these things. All right, what about outputs? Um, yeah, mostly in your urine. So we're gonna get rid of electrolytes. But again, you guys work out, that sweat comes with salt. It's gonna have sodium and chloride and some potassium, some urea, you can get some, some excretion through your skin with sweat. Um, so definitely if you work out, you're like, oh, you don't want to drink distilled water to early. You have to replace your electrolytes too because you lost water and the electrolytes. Pedialyte, you can see this as it say, uh, pediatric electrolytes. And so, yeah, if your kids got diarrhea or sick, this helps replace those electrolytes that could go out of whack if you're just getting rid of water like crazy. Yeah, but again, for, for the test, you know, where do you get rid of the most electrolytes? Your urine, again, your urine. Oh, for those of you, a lot of sports people out there, um, I played soccer in college, I, I played some sports, I never, uh, not a serious athlete, but um, anyway, the uh, you'll hear some things like this. I want you to, to put it into to context here. You see like, oh, here's a complete sports drink. And you see, this is, it has all the electrolytes. What's it got there? It's got sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. That's cool. And you'll see this company say, oh yeah, we're the complete one because that one's gotta be Gatorade, right? They, they, they're incomplete, you know? You're not, but you guys need to be smart consumers. And um, the study, if you looked at it, um, both Gatorade and Powerade give you enough sodium, potassium, lots of it, right? But then um, I believe it's the Powerade that's saying, oh, but I give you calcium and magnesium, right? But then if you look at it, look at this, you have more calcium in tap water than you do in this. So again, I, I always, I'm a real critic of uh, advertising and uh, truth and facts, you know, kind of thing. So, uh, uh, right. So is this more complete? Well, yeah, but you don't really need it. All right. So as I said, sodium, 90% electrolytes in the extracellular fluid. So uh, sodium is a big one, isn't it? Yeah, and the big ones are sodium, potassium, and calcium. Yeah, we've gone over the, because I use these in, in the nervous system, the muscle system, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, just three more slides. So um, these are just some examples of using electrolytes and uh, their feedback. And uh, I'll have one more lecture on this. I'll lecture uh, one more. We'll go through uh, some other things. But for this one, let's say you have like uh, low sodium. All right, so what it's going to do, uh, remember the kidney tubules? You have that juxta glomerular apparatus that is going to recognize, oh, sodium is low, I got low blood pressure. And then uh, you may secrete some renin in this case. It's actually directly, or with the renin, it's gonna make, it's gonna convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin two eventually. And it's gonna make you secrete aldosterone, all right. I don't know if I specifically have told you this before, but now I'm telling you, aldosterone, what does it do? It's gonna cause your kidney tubules to retain sodium. What does that mean? That means you're gonna um, reclaim it. So let's say you're, you're about to pee it out, but you take it back into the bloodstream. Well, when you take sodium back, chloride's gonna follow it because it's negative, you're positive. And then when you take salt back, water. You're going to retain water. So the two hormones, both ADH and aldosterone, have the same ultimate goal of having you retain more water, and thus they raise your blood pressure too. But they do it differently. Remember, ADH opens up pores in the collecting duct so water can be kept. Aldosterone is going to just ramp up your reabsorption of sodium, especially in that distal tube. You take the sodium back, and then the water is going to come back too. Yep. And so it's going to, uh, aldosterone is going to make you uh, re absorb, reabsorb more sodium and thus negative feedback is going to say, okay, we got enough. So that sodium drops, um, 
you are going to secrete aldosterone, which is going to make you retain more sodium. What do we got here? Here we're looking at blood pressure, it looks like. And uh, so here we have too high a blood pressure because I'm seeing increased stretch of the atria. So the, your heart's being stretched. You're going to release this hormone, this ANP, which is going to go down and it's going to have the effect of lowering your blood pressure. Well, how do you lower your blood pressure? You can make your heart go slower or you can get rid of fluid too, right? Because you retain fluid, your blood pressure goes up. So in this case, if your blood pressure is too high, you're going to inhibit ADH. ADH makes you retain water. So that's going to make you pee out more water, lower your blood pressure. You're also going to not make as much aldosterone, which makes you retain sodium and water. So get rid of the sodium, get rid of the water. So those two things are going to decrease your blood volume. So now you've got less sodium, the water leaves, no problem, it's going to lower that. Oh, and here's the whole, uh, this way, when you, um, um, you uh, the, uh, the renin release. So that's also, um, renin is going to make you um, secrete aldosterone. So you don't, you're not trying to do that. It's also going to make your uh, blood vessels um, uh, uh, relax if you have less, less of this too. And that's also going to decrease your blood pressure. So renin is going to help increase your blood pressure if it's too low. But in this case, you're inhibiting that. And so your vessel is just relaxed. So that's going to lower your blood pressure. You're going to pee out more water. Your blood pressure comes down. So I'm kind of throwing like how this whole feedback works here. And lastly, um, calcium, right? So calcium, um, if you have, what are we looking at here? What are we doing? Hypo. So we have too little calcium. I did this already. We did this in a hormone, we did an endocrine system. So too little calcium. So it's, you're gonna, the parathyroid glands recognize that. They measure the blood. Oh, dude, my calcium is uh, really low. I'm gonna release parathyroid hormone. And that's gonna have three effects. It's gonna cause your bone to be broken down by the osteoclasts, releasing calcium into the blood. Dude, I got more calcium. It's also going to activate your vitamin D, which is going to make you absorb more from your diet. You may drink milk and eat cheese, but parathyroid hormone allows you to absorb it into your bloodstream. And thirdly, it's going to tell your kidneys, um, this is too low, it's going to tell them to be stingy, hold on to the calcium, reabsorb it, we need more. And all these things are going to have the effect of increasing your blood calcium, and then the parathyroid hormone, parathyroid glands can relax. Uh, and calcitonin, the hormone, does the opposite. All right, good kind of overview. I mean, mostly, I'm going to talk a lot, a lot of detail, but I talked about uh, input and output of water and these electrolytes. And I gave you some examples of that, right? So mainly from this lecture, now what's the greatest... Uh, source of water, you know, drinking or wet foods. What's the greatest, how do we get rid of water the most? <clears throat> it's gonna be in urine and then also perspiration and feces. And like that. So um, big thing, our, our water balance, how we do that. And then our electrolytes, how we keep them all um, um, in homeostasis. All right, uh, second half of this lecture for you guys too. <laughs>